Hey everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. Thank you so much for joining us in this new format where we can continue to bring authors and their new books to the community. As this is a new venture, please bear with us as we work out the kinks and get more comfortable with this new platform. Uh, at any time during the event, you can click on the green button below to purchase tonight's book on Politics and Prose's website. We're currently offering free media mail shipping on all domestic orders, and every purchase goes to support our small business at a time when we truly need it the most. Tonight, you can ask a question by, of our author by clicking the Ask a Question feature below. It can be at the bottom of your screen. You submit your question as well as read other questions and even upvote the ones you most like to hear. Also know that the author, host, and audience members cannot see you through the screen, so feel free to relax and get comfortable. Finally, we want to thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It's small businesses like Politics and Protest that especially need your support in times like these. And so without any further ado, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. David A. Kessler to Politics and Prose Live. Dr. Kessler is a pediatrician and former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and is one of the country's foremost experts on health. He has also recently been appointed to Joe Biden's Public Health Advisory Committee, offering daily advisories to Biden on the evolving COVID-19 pandemic. In his talk today, he will be talking about his new book, Best Practices to Stay Healthy and Informed in These Difficult Times, as well as take questions about both his vital current work with COVID-19 and his groundbreaking past research. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. David A. Kessler. Thanks, Tom. Um, thank uh, everyone uh, for joining in these extraordinary times. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and you and your family are well. And thank you to Pollux, Politics and Prose. Uh, please support them, especially uh, during these times. Uh, there's a way uh, to order the book. Uh, they have it uh, in stock. They'll ship it. Um, the, the most important thing is to, to support them. And please bear with us. Um, they put uh, this together in a matter of days to be able to do this technologically. Uh, I'm not sure um, I will get it exactly right. So please bear uh, with us. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, I, as many people, have been deeply involved in trying to understand as much as we can <clears throat> about this virus. Um, um, Dr. Uh, Vivek Murphy, um, the former Surgeon General, a number of other uh, uh, individuals, and I uh, the, have been briefing the former Vice President uh, Biden on the epidemic uh, on a daily basis. The, I spoke to Brad and, and Lissa, and um, I said, maybe we should just talk uh, about the epidemic. Um, and there was a plea um, from the bookstore um, to also talk uh, about uh, the book. So maybe the best way is um, to take a brief uh, break from talking about the epidemic uh, for uh, a, a short bit and recognize that once we get through this epidemic, we're going to want to be healthy. So let me spend about 10, 15 minutes uh, and tell you about the book uh, that I was working on uh, for uh, the last three, uh, four years that comes out uh, next uh, Tuesday. One note up front, uh, food has the enormous power to comfort uh, and nothing I say should diminish uh, that, especially in a very stressful uh, period. Let me, um, I have, I have a few slides, just let me, if I can just take you through sort of just the very uh, basics. You know, only, th this all started with a, a recognition and really a striking recognition uh, that only 12% uh, of us, according to uh, medical guidelines, are metabolically healthy. Uh, that means some 87% of us don't meet guidelines when it comes to weight or blood glucose, uh, blood uh, lipids, or blood uh, pressure. Um, and the fact is that it is the foods for most of us, um, the processes that convert what we eat and drink uh, into energy uh, the, the food and, uh, and drink that we put in our bodies, 
that leads for many of us uh, into what I call metabolic chaos. And that can be abnormalities in blood glucose, uh, blood lipids, uh, hypertension. Uh, and at the core of that um, is uh, weight. Um, let me go back um, several uh, decades and, and try to see if I can explain how we got here. Um, if you go back to the 1970s uh, and you just look at the McGovern uh, Committee on Nutrition that uh, dealt initially with hunger uh, and people not getting enough calories in the United uh, States, those guidelines in the 1970s and in the 1980s, when you look at them, um, and these were the ones that were uh, in effect at the time that we did uh, the food label, the, those guidelines were to reduce total fat intake, to reduce saturated fat. There was a lot of focus on heart disease, to reduce cholesterol, and to limit simple sugars. But the recommendations from the 1970s, 1988 HHS guidelines was to increase complex carbohydrates. And you'll know the, the food pyramid at the bottom of that. It was plenty of vegetables, uh, fruits, and grain products. And in fact, uh, let me just show you a nutrition facts uh, label uh, and ask you what this food is. Um, this is an actual label. Um, it has 330 calories per serving. There is no fat in it. There is no sugar uh, in it. Um, it has a considerable amount of sodium uh, and its total carbohydrates um, are 21% uh, and also has protein. So the, no fat, no sugar. You know, by the, the, the previous uh, guidelines that I gave you, uh, that food seems to, to meet those uh, guidelines. Um, and if you were, we were together, if uh, we were back and forth, I, I'd ask you to say what you think that food is. Um, and um, that, uh, that's a bagel. Um, now, I am not going after bagels. I have them uh, in my uh, refrigerator. Um, but the fact is that when you look at that line, total carbohydrates, we didn't fully understand, right? We understood about sugar, uh, but you know, we, we lumped all carbohydrates uh, together. And what is at the key, you know, really at the root uh, of uh, most uh, metabolic chaos, I mean, I would hypothesize, are what I call fast carbs. And certainly we've, you know, we've known about uh, sugar, but it's not just sugar. Uh, it is sugar and starch. And the fact is, over the past century, uh, Americans have great, less uh, half century, Americans have greatly increased their intake of fast carbs. I mean, and that really has, um, if you look at that history, um, it, it goes back several hundred years. If you go to Mount Vernon and you look at in the main house and you look uh, uh, in uh, the living room at George Washington's home and you look at that ceiling, you, you see uh, the wheat uh, carved into to the wood. Washington had hoped uh, that America would be the granary to the world. I mean, he wrote that um, to Lafayette, uh, the flat uh, grasslands, the soil, we were going to be um, the exporter uh, of grains uh, to the world. And just to, just to review a little botany, um, so you can understand the science um, that leads from uh, this, you know, in some ways, <laughs> this wonderful, wonderful source of energy um, and how this energy and the source of energy could possibly be linked to metabolic disease. And let me just see if I can connect the dots for a moment. So this is a, you know, a stalk of, of wheat. Um, you all know the wheat kernel, and within that wheat kernel, the outer layers of the bran and the endosperm. 
uh, the bran and the germ, and the majority of the energy is stored um, in what's called uh, the endosperm, and that is starch. Uh, and starch, uh, that starch comes in starch granules, and that, that those starch granules have a number of barriers uh, to uh, digestion. And certainly the seed coat uh, and the outer membrane layers in milling, milling, because uh, you, you can't, uh, you'd break your teeth um, if you didn't have some processing of uh, these uh, kernels. Um, milling uh, takes off those outer uh, layers. Here's the starch granule uh, under an electron uh, microscope. And, and what you see um, if you study that starch granule, is that starch is very highly organized. It is very tightly packed within um, uh, those granules. And you all learned, we all learned in uh, 10th grade, 11th grade biology, those, uh, they were made of chains of amylose and amylopectin, but it was the structure of that granule that is key. So milling did, takes out the, um, takes off the first and, and second layer. But much of uh, food today, if you walk in uh, into a supermarket and walk up and down uh, the aisle, much of the food and the processing techniques uh, are done um, by uh, mechanisms. This one uh, shows that you take that starch after it's been milled and you put it through an extrude an extruder, it's, it, it's an extrusion process. And that extruder has great heat, great forces, mechanical forces. And what that extrusion process does is obviously it converts that starch and that starch granule uh, and cooks it, um, but it forms many different shapes. And then you look at about 60% of our processed foods, I mean, include uh, this processed starch, but what comes out of that processing, that extruded starch, you can see um, you can see that that starch, that amylopectin, that that granule is significantly um, dis uh, disrupted. And in fact, these starches uh, have the intact structure of that na natural grain pummeled out of them. And here is again, you go from a tightly packed native granule, uh, you uh, subject to heat and mechanical forces, uh, and um, the, the end result on that starch is the breakdown of these chains. It increases the surface area. So before you even put it in your mouth, the food is in essence pre-digested. Um, and the, the key the, the, the key point is that altered structure of processed foods makes it rapidly absorbed uh, in the GI tract. Uh, and how does that work? Um, you, you all remember this from biology. Um, the food is uh, ingested uh, in the esophagus, in the stomach, uh, and you see uh, the, the green dots, um, the, uh, the rapidly digestible carbohydrates get absorbed very early on in the small intestines and don't even make it down into the lower intestines. So the structure of foods is absolutely key. And we never really focused uh, on the structure of foods. You know, when we did the food label um, in the early 1990s, and, and even today, no one really has asked the question, what is the effect of processing on destroying the structure? We used to think, certainly when I'm in med school, that the GI tract was in essence a tube, but it's anything but. Uh, it's a complex sensory uh, organ uh, that has many hormones are released. And you can see uh, in the green part in this slide, that food that is, that is widely uh, dispersed and that starch, that structure uh, is destroyed, it gets absorbed in the early part and there is a release of certain hormones um, uh, that can stimulate insulin. And yet there's other hormones, the GLP hormones, 
um, that get released into the lower GI tract. And we don't fully understand the biology of uh, these hormones, but the GLP hormones are some of the most effective drugs today in treating metabolic uh, diseases such as uh, diabetes. And by having the food rapidly absorb and stimulating um, the insulin secreting hormones and not uh, secreting the satiety and fullness hormones, that, that rapid absorbability of that literally endless amount of glucose, that I think is um, uh, presumptively at the core of much of metabolic disease. No one ever asked, what is the effect of flooding our bodies, you know, constantly um, with uh, these rapidly digestible um, uh, carbohydrates? The, these are graphs, I mean, from the great uh, Frank Nuttall and Mary Gannon. And you can just see that what they did is when you feed people, in essence, high starch diets, um, it has a real... Uh, and they studied that um, over a, a five week period, uh, there was real elevation in blood glucose. Take away that starch, take away that pre-digested rapidly absorbable glucose for five weeks, and you can see that there's a marked uh, diminution uh, in blood uh, glucose uh, levels. You know, if you ask uh, the, the great endocrinologists, um, you know, we've always thought that it was the excess intake of calories, especially um, high fat diets that led to obesity and that obesity led to insulin resistance. I think, you know, we need to reconsider and there is uh, evidence that in fact, the excess intake of these rapidly absorbable carbohydrates, um, the model, you know, is, is uh, not as we necessarily think of, because that uh, ex excess intake of carbohydrates can lead to elevated blood glucose, elevated insulin levels, and that results in obesity. But regardless of the, 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 the science, one of the reasons um, that uh, it's so hard to lose weight once you um, have uh, gained weight, or I mean, we, you know, and you know, I've cert str certainly struggled throughout my my life, losing weight, gaining weight, um, losing it again, is that we get caught in, on either model. You see that you get caught in this vicious cycle of obesity, um, insulin uh, resistance. Uh, 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 and once you get caught uh, in this cycle of obesity, uh, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, it's very hard. Um, uh, to get out. Um, if you look at the scientific evidence, and if I had an hour talk, I would take you through, you know, all of it. But there is no doubt um, that uh, not only the, uh, the clinical trial uh, data, but the observational data uh, out of um, uh, Frank Hu's group um, shows that diets with high starch and low fiber um, are associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is the relative risk curve. And you can see as you increase your starch, uh, certainly your starch to fiber uh, ratio, um, your starch intake, you increase your relative risk of type 2 diabetes uh, significantly. And this has been uh, repeated in a number uh, of studies. One of the uh, things that give me, gives me most uh, confidence in uh, this uh, notion that rapidly absorbable carbohydrates are key when it comes to uh, both weight, uh, metabolic disease, um, is the fact that there is a drug uh, that is on the market. Um, and that drug blocks starch uptake. And that drug and you can see the way what it, that, that drug uh, decreases the absorption of rapidly absorbable glucose. And that drug is approved in clinical trials. It's been shown that if you can block the absorption of starch molecules 
uh, in the upper GI uh, tract, uh, you can, uh, uh, th that is an approved therapy for type 2 diabetes. So we've talked about fast carbs. What are slow carbs? Um, you know that. Uh, they are vegetables, legumes, high fiber foods, uh, intact whole grains. Not everything labeled whole grain uh, on the label uh, is in fact a slow carb. Only if that structure is uh, maintained. Uh, that structure is absolutely key um, to metabolic health. What I try to do in the book is to cut through the noise uh, out there, the conflicting uh, uh, theories uh, and approaches. What kind of diet should I be on? Is it Mediterranean? Is it keto? Um, is it low, low fat? And the book basically uh, tries to make the, the, the point that there are three basic recommendations. Um, and if you follow these recommendations, you could dramatically affect your health. One is to limit fast carbs. But this is not just about fast carbs. Number two, the, the, the recommendation is the book is to lower LDL. And the third is to exercise with moderated in, uh, intensity on a daily basis. If you follow those recommendations, limit fast carbs, lower uh, LDL, uh, and exercise with moderate intensity, um, that is... I think for almost everybody, uh, that is a, those are keys um, to good health. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time other than to say that when it comes to lowering LDL, I mean, the fact is that LDL particles, I mean, cause atherosclerotic heart disease. We know, and one of the things we did, um, these are, they, they go by very different names. Uh, they also include the triglycerides. But we know from uh, the clinical trials that we did um, at the FDA, at the, at the, that the FDA has required, certainly with regard to drugs, um, and there is a caveat because this data comes from drugs, but the lower the LDL, the lower the risk of atherosclerotic heart disease. You can, you, as you go lower and lower on LDL, you can, you lower the risk of atherosclerotic heart disease. And that evidence comes from multiple sources. It, it comes from the, the best clinical trials. It comes from genetic uh, Mendelian randomization studies. Uh, and the fact is if everybody, if we can get everyone's LDL down in this country, we can uh, eliminate 70, 80% of atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, last recommendation uh, um, uh, is uh, that um, uh, is to exercise with moderate intensity exercise. That gives you the uh, ability to maintain insulin sensitivity. Uh, and that allows the body to be able to regulate uh, certainly in an environment of excess energy intake, having that sink, in essence, that drain, uh, uh, that exercise, a lot of other benefits, but being able to stay metabolically flexible uh, is key. Uh, one slide, just to, to emphasize, um, when we were talking about lowering LDL, no doubt, and there are many different ways to uh, lower LDL, but a diet emphasizing plants and slow carbs is optimal uh, for health. So three simple uh, recommendations, uh, limit fast carbs, lower uh, LDL, exercise uh, with moderate intensity. Those uh, can change um, our health uh, dramatically. Uh, let me stop there, uh, Tom, and uh, Take some questions uh, if I can. Okay, thank you so much, David. That was incredibly uh, interesting and informative. I think we all learned a lot. Um, before we go to questions, just want to remind you that you can purchase David's book, Fast Carbs, Slow Carbs, from the green button at the bottom of your screens. And if you still have questions, please ask them at the Ask a Question button. So our first question 
comes from Owen. Are we still really connected? Is this really working? Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank You're you. Uh, so our first question comes from Owen. How does one keep their immune system strong in the age of Corona? Um, there are things you, you, you can do, um, and there are things that are uh, beyond um, our uh, control. Um, so the, the, the fact is, uh, everything we were talking about uh, with reference to metabolic uh, disease, we certainly know that diabetes um, does contribute uh, and has a real effect um, on um, uh, the immune system. And that's why you see when people talk uh, today about the underlying risk uh, factors, who's doing well, who's not doing well, um, diabetes uh, is uh, very high uh, on the list in part because we don't fully understand the mechanism. Um, but uh, if, if you follow that chain um, uh, from those processed foods to uh, those fast carbs, that rapidly absorbable glucose, that hyperinsulinemia, uh, that affects many organs uh, throughout the body. So diabetes, um, what we eat, um, that has an effect. Um, the, the fact is uh, there are some things we don't control. Um, the, there's no doubt as you age, uh, you weaken uh, your immune system. But if you can put off those underlying uh, risk factors such as uh, diabetes, um, that certainly uh, would help dramatically. Okay, this next question comes from Tiffany. Can you talk about carbs and inflammatory response? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent uh, question. Um, that uh, hyperinsulinemia that is caused by uh, fast carbs um, lead uh, to inflammatory uh, processes, no question. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you follow that chain um, to its uh, conclusion, um, you see that that also has an effect um, uh, on cardiovascular disease. So when I talked about being able to reduce LDL down uh, significantly, and that could wipe out 70, 80%, there's a residual effect that I, that I can't quite get to by just uh, fast carbs. And, and that's probably some other inflammatory processes uh, that uh, go on. So there is a direct link between these rapidly absorbable um, carbohydrates uh, and uh, the inflammatory processes. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the result of these, uh, are, are the metabolic chaos um, uh, affects the whole body. Okay, our next question comes from Rachel. She asks, what are your thoughts on the intuitive eating mo movement? So there are many ways um, that work um, and, and can help. Um, and there are certainly psychological uh, tricks and techniques. Um, uh, intuitive eating uh, is one of them. Um, but whatever psychological mechanisms you bring to bear and how you think about food and, and look at food, um, you know, I still think it's almost impossible, no matter what you bring to bear, uh, to control weight. Um, certainly if you've struggled with weight, uh, with these par processed, uh, carbohydrate. Um, so, you know, you, every one of us is going to be different. Um, we have to recognize, uh, and that's true for diet, but at the core, um, these fast carbs are acting. Uh, uh, like processed poisons. Okay. Our next question comes from Nicole. She wants to know, what about fermentation? I've read that using sourdough makes carbs more easily digestible. Is there any benefit? You know, I, the evidence that uh, I have uh, seen, in fact, uh, and I'll go back and, and look at it, um, the uh, those who study carbohydrate metabolism have suggested uh, that sourdough, uh, in fact, uh, makes um, uh, absorption 
less rapid. Um, so I, you know, I think uh, obviously uh, we have contradictory uh, uh, ideas on, on this. Um, I mean, there are certain intact whole grains um, such as pumpernickel uh, and rye, um, and you can you 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 actually feel it when you you uh, when you chew and and, and you eat. Um, the more intact the structure of the food, um, uh, the uh, certainly uh, the food uh, grains have to be milled, but uh, not further processed. Okay, our, our next question comes from Tiffany. She asks, if you can block absorption in the upper GI with a drug, how will that affect bowel movements? Oh, so um, good question. Um, and you have that. Um, uh, no doubt um, that um, fiber, uh, we all know, uh, has uh, an effect uh, on uh, bowel movements um, and uh, getting uh, food down to the lower GI tract. That increase in fiber, um, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the inverse of this rapidly absorbable uh, glucose. Um, so it uh, certainly uh, will give you uh, bowel movements um, uh, and uh, there is more delivery to the lower uh, GI tract uh, if you uh, eliminate uh, those, uh, those fast carbs. But increasing fiber, I mean, is, is, is key. Um, and that, you know, we've seen it. Uh, it's important for colon cancer. Uh, it's important for cardiovascular disease. There are different mechanisms at play. There is an increase, and it concerns me about uh, certainly colon cancer um, in younger populations. Um, and I see that epidemiology. I'm not sure I fully understand the, the root of it, but high fiber diets can help uh, certainly with colon cancer uh, and cardiovascular disease, as well as good bowel health. Okay, uh, Ellen would like to, you to please define fast carbs. Fast carbs are those carbs that are rapidly absorbed uh, in um, the digestive tract. Um, so it's uh, for the scientists and docs out there, it's the uh, proximal uh, GI tract. Um, it's the duodenum, the stomach, the duodenum, um, and uh, uh, slow carbs are those that get delivered to the lower GI tract, um, uh, those uh, in uh, and, and the colon. Um, if you can get food down to the lower GI tract, that's where uh, the microbiome is, that's where fermentation is. When you rapidly absorb uh, your uh, carbohydrates in the early part of the GI tract, you're absorbing everything. You're absor absorbing all the calories. You can get food down to the lower GI tract, and there's more structure to that foods. You know, the bacteria take over, and yes, you absorb some of the calories, but you're not absorbing 100% of the calories. Okay, uh, Carolyn wants to know uh, if you could please explain soluble versus insoluble fiber, which do we want? Yeah, uh, so great question. Uh, FDA has changed its definitions, for example, over the years. Um, what you want um, is not fiber that just gets added uh, to processed food. You want whole intact food that has the fiber um, uh, there naturally. I think that's why, in fact, I, I think that's the, the, the sort of understanding of, of rapidly absorbable fast carbs and slow carbs it's why vegetables and legumes are so good for us, because the fiber is in there naturally. Uh, and um, that, and it gets down to our lower GI tract, the microbiome uh, can take over, um, but it's fiber that's the, it's in the natural state. Uh, it, you know, sometimes uh, manufacturers will take fast carbs and just add fiber to it, and they'll add different fiber to it, um, and that's not the fiber um, that uh, we're talking about because you're still exposed to the processed carbs. So it, it's not the definition that's key. Is if it doesn't look like food, if it doesn't look uh, intact, um, that's not the fiber you want. 
Okay, our next question comes from Joanne. Joanne asks you to please provide examples of slow carbs and fast carbs. So uh, fast carbs are um, uh, uh, those uh, uh, walk down the cereal aisle. Um, anything that has been uh, processed, um, anything uh, that has uh, been subject to extrusion or gun puffing, um, where uh, that kernel of wheat that I showed uh, was destroyed. Um, slow carbs are, I mean, just think of it this way, any vegetable, any legume, any intact whole grain is a slow carb. Uh, we have a next question here. What is the best way to lower LDL? Is drugs and diet equivalent? Boy, that's a great question. Um, and I have studied that. Um, and um, I think that uh, both are important routes. Um, uh, and both, um, you, you can achieve reductions in LDL. You go on a plant-based uh, diet, uh, I've seen LDLs drop um, by about as much as 40%. There is no doubt that um, the LDL lowering drugs, and there's a whole group of them beyond the statins today, um, they are more powerful. They can get your LDL down faster um, and even lower. But, you know, I, I had this conversation with the great Gene Brownwald, who's one of the great cardiologists, um, a number of months ago. Um, and, you know, it's tempting to say, well, just go to a drug, just take a statin. And, you know, he said to me, no, um, that's not uh, the way to do it. Uh, the best way to do it is to start um, uh, with diet. Now, if you can't get your LDL uh, down uh, that way, um, getting LDL down is so important. Um, I don't want to be here giving you medical advice, but certainly talk um, to your uh, physician. Uh, but both, um, as a questioner, you know, rightfully asked, both diet and drugs are important tools, but please get LDL down because we can wipe out atherosclerotic heart disease, a vast majority of it in our lifetime. Stephanie wants to know, can you comment on the role of fat, including saturated fat like butter, in helping reduce weight due to the satiety that they offer? Without adequate fat, don't people get hungrier faster and keep eating and putting on weight? Yeah. There, there's, no, there's no doubt um, that compared to rapidly uh, absorbable glucose, uh, fat is uh, more satiating. The data is somewhat uh, confusing. Um, I think that uh, rather than talking, um, you know, about, uh, you know, this, uh, is it the fast carbs? Is it the fat? Uh, the non-processed food, um, no doubt, because of its fiber contact, because of its structure, um, can be uh, satiating. Now, you, you have to adapt to it. Um, uh, but I think the the real key uh, is goes back to whole intact food that has not been processed. That I think is the, the best uh, advice. Our next question comes from Roseanne. Any advice to the current scientists who are trying to work with the president? Advice to Dr. Hahn, who no longer appears during press conferences. Yeah. So, um, I think uh, Tony Fauci is a national hero. Um, I, I have known Tony um, since um, 1990. We did HIV together. Um, we worked together. You know, when, when we started, there was only one drug. 1990, it was mediocre. Uh, it was AZT, didn't work very well. And Tony and I spent the next six years, and that's what it took. Uh, to change the course of that disease. But, you know, by 1996, 1997, we had the protease inhibitors. Um, Tony uh, will um, uh, find us a vaccine. Tony will, with a lot of help, uh, find antivirals. 
you know, I'm hopeful that we'll see those antivirals in, in short order. I don't think they're going to be the be all, uh, uh, end all. Um, but I think that there are, there's reason to think that, uh, over the next number of months, uh, we'll have some efficacy. Um, let me, um, just celebrate Tony, uh, support Tony. Um, uh, I, you know, my heart goes out. Um, there's a story on the front page just got posted uh, about the, the conspiracy theories about Tony. None of that is true. You know, let him do his job. Um, you know, Mr. President, listen, uh, listen to Dr. Fauci. Uh, we will get uh, through this. Uh, Katie asks, are steel cut oats considered intact grains? I think so. I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are purists uh, uh, among us, um, but I think that um, everything I know, um, they're, they're not the fast carbs that are causing the problems uh, that we're seeing with the American diet. Uh, Keith and Ann ask, as FDA commissioner, you mandated nutrition labeling. Would you revise those labels to better consider some of the issues that you have raised? Sure. I mean, I think I showed you that uh, that label that just lumped slow carbs and fast carbs together um, in this line called total carbohydrates. And in fact, is you know, I tried to demonstrate this afternoon that I mean, starch is in essence. It ends up because of uh, when it's processed, uh, it ends up no different uh, in the body as a sugar. So I think we need to do better, a better job on the total carbohydrate uh, line. I think we need to do uh, a better job with the ingredient label. Um, I don't think that is uh, helpful. And, and I think uh, many of the products that are labeled whole wheat um, really are just processed fast carbs um, with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the brand, uh, and the germ added back, but, the uh, the core of the product is still fast carbs, but it can be labeled whole wheat. So, and I think that's problematic. So I think there are multiple, uh, changes that we can, uh, make, uh, because I think we now have the science and we've learned a lot, uh, since, uh, 19, uh, 92 when we uh, did uh, the label that we didn't uh, fully understand before. Uh, Nancy would like to know, what level of LDL do you suggest people aim to achieve? Um, so that is, that needs to be individualized. Um, uh, you know, and it obviously depends on one's risk factors. Um, if you talk privately, and I don't want to give medical advice here, but if you talk to cardiologists, um, they are trying to keep get their LD levels, LDL levels uh, to around 70. Now, that's not going to work for everybody, um, you know, uh, but certainly uh, below uh, 100 uh, if you can. But it depends on the risk factors in the family. It depends where you are. My goal is to just urge everyone to focus on it um, and to try to get uh, it down some uh, percentage. But the actual level, uh, that's something between you and your doctor. Okay, this is a related question from Debbie. Um, how important is ratio with LDL, uh, specifically if you have a high LDL but an excellent ratio? I assume that you're talking about ratio, there are a number of different uh, ratios. It's actually the number of B containing LDL particles that are key. Now, that's a mouthful. Um, and uh, we've, uh, you know, we've, uh, in the past, we've talked about HDL. I think that's the ratio uh, the Debbie may be referring to um, really is the total number of LDL particles and triglycerides. That's the number that I think uh, certainly shows that's what's causative in atherosclerotic heart disease. I want to focus on the ratios because um, I don't think there is, um, they reveal as much information 
It's just uh, total uh, LDL particles. Okay, our next question is from Vivek. He wants to know, how healthy is eating wheat? So um, the issue is in what form? Right? Is it an intact whole grain? Um, uh, is it highly processed? Um, uh, certainly if it's highly processed uh, and you struggle uh, with your weight, uh, if you're metabolically vulnerable, um, I think it can be problematic. You know, there's a certain percentage of the population, 15% uh, or so, um, that can maintain metabolic flexibility um, no matter what. And I don't fully understand um, that biology, but cer certainly the, the, the normal biology for the vast majority of Americans who struggle with their weight, and that has become the norm, I think processed carbs um, are problematic. Okay, our next question comes from Jill. What do you think about a keto approach with modest fat coupled with intermittent fasting to weight reduction and health? So um, the reason I wrote the book um, was to try to see if I can find an agreement or peace, if you would, um, among the various um, uh, different uh, views. Um, I was at a panel of the American Heart Association a little while back. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Gardner was chairing the panel, and there were those who were advocating a keto diet. There were those who were advocating uh, a Mediterranean uh, diet, a paleo diet. And, and I just asked uh, the, the question, can we all agree that cutting out rapidly absorbable glucose is a good thing? And um, that uh, everybody agreed to. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because no matter what diet approach you, uh, you want to take, cutting out rapidly absorbable glucose, I think is the key. Now, um, uh, on a ketogenic diet, once you cut out those rapidly absorbable glucose, and I give enormous credit you know, um, uh, to my friend Gary Taubes and, and others who really have thought this through over the years. I mean, the key, I think, to focus on, the, the, the real problem has been those rapidly absorbable glucose. So the question is, what do you, you know, um, what do you substitute uh, in place of that? You know, the old Atkins diet of that of butter and fat and no uh, carbs, if you're on that, the data suggests that uh, LDL rises, you know, a, a little bit, uh, maybe 10% on average. Sometimes it doesn't rise. In some people, it rises a lot. My problem with that is that that's in the wrong direction. I want to bring everyone's LDL down. So a ketogenic diet, I'm not sure it has to be ketogenic. I'm not sure you have to be below 30 grams of, of carbohydrates. If, I, if somebody uh, is diabetic or pre-diabetic, and you get them below 150 uh, grams of carbohydrate, you can see enormous changes uh, in their metabolic parameters. Um, but so I would be careful uh, on the saturated fat if it's increasing LDL, because I want to get LDL down. But certainly limiting, uh, if you define ketogenic, um, as some are these days, of limiting fast uh, carbs uh, and uh, replacing that with uh, healthy um, uh, healthy uh, fats, uh, I have no problems uh, with that. I think the key culprit are these rapidly absorbable uh, carbohydrates. Okay, we have a question from Ruth. She says, wonderful to see you working on this important topic today. As a pediatrician and with childhood obesity on the rise, do you have any suggestions for families, especially in lower income, income groups, to change the course of this growing problem? So, so that, it, it, it's a wonderful question. Um, and um, it, it, it is absolutely key um, because there is no doubt uh, if you look at who is eating processed carbohydrates, I mean, there is, uh, an income disparity. 
So all the efforts, um, uh, Michelle Obama's effort, um, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, those who've spent their careers on improving uh, school uh, lunches and the quality of those school uh, lunches um, to uh, whole foods, I think is absolutely key. The, the, the one question scientifically, and this I think applies to all children and uh, adolescents, the fact is that when you look at heart disease, atherosclerotic heart disease is the result of an accumulation of LDL over a lifetime. So it's almost like pack years. You know, I have a 40 year pack uh, history of smoking. And you know, certainly you, know, you look at um, uh, me or my generation, you know, uh, the, our risk factors began when we were adolescents um, uh, with, you know, in childhood and, and adolescence. So we don't quite know it, but I, I think as we learn more, lowering LDL is going to be important um, early on. And certainly in your 20s and, and 30s, uh, it's certainly not too early to begin to recognize that if we really want to wipe out heart disease and uh, really, uh, heart attacks and strokes, we can do that but it's going to require intervention early on. I'm not willing to say, you know, to put, uh, you know, children and adolescents um, on drugs. That's not uh, what I'm saying uh, at all. We have to recognize this is a lifetime accumulation um, of the effects of the diet. Okay, uh, David wants to know, which LDLs are you referring to? C, P, or small p? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm focusing specifically on any ApoB uh, containing uh, LDL. Um, in, the, um, in the parlance, it's any non-HDL lipoprotein, and I include in those triglycerides. Um, uh, I mean, now, for most people uh, uh, in the audience, they're going to go, what did you just say, Kessler? Um, and what I said uh, was focus on, on your LDL. The science on what's causative uh, is it's the number uh, of ApoB containing lipoproteins. That's where the Mendelian randomization studies, um, uh, where the data go. But for, the, for most of us, how to implement that, forget what I just said, get your LDL uh, down. Um, you can dramatically affect uh, your risk of heart disease. Our next question comes from David. He wants to know, is popcorn a slow carb? No. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say before we go on to the next question, we have uh, only a few more minutes left, so we're not going to get to everyone's questions, but thank you everyone for asking a question. Really appreciate you. And it just was so nice, you know, uh, just so nice to be with you all. Sorry, I'm looking into a black lens and I don't see any of you um, uh, on the screen. Uh, and it's so hard uh, to connect this way. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be uh, with you. Um, and I'm so happy that people are asking me questions that are not just uh, virus. Uh, related, and it shows you that people do care very much about uh, uh, their health. You want to take uh, two or three more questions, Tom, and um, then we can uh, call it a wrap? Sure. Um, this next one actually is a virus-related question from Marlene. She wants to know, can you provide some insights on suggestions that you have given Biden on how to respond to the dangerous misinformation as well as inaction, delivered or not, by the president? Let's just let's talk about moving forward. Um, let's talk about um, you know obviously there is a crisis in our hospitals, uh, the PPE, the ventilators. That's um, that's first order of business. The real question, the hard question um, that you know we we've discussed um, certainly uh, with the vice president. But I've discussed it, I mean, this week in teaching uh, online with students in epidemiology, is what's the, and it may be the hardest question in our lifetime 
to answer. How do we know when we can uh, open the valve or return to work um, and start coming out? Uh, that, that, that criteria uh, and, and getting that right, um, I think is key. I can think through and you know, feel free to email me if you have a better answer. I think the only way we're going to know when we can um, open that valve is if there is I mean, massively increased testing. We don't know yet um, the exact asymptomatic carrier rate that uh, or who are infectious, but we certainly see saw the damage, uh, you know, the, the harm. Um, you know, this started no fault of their own with, you know, just a few individuals being infected and that rate of infectivity and whatever the mortality ends up being with this virus. I mean, that's, you know, a few infected individuals certainly can, can cause uh, a major outbreak or a mini epicenter or a, or a major uh, hotspot. And while we were focusing on testing initially, when we got into the hospital crisis uh, and running out of beds, run, <clears throat> running out of ventilators, running out of masks, uh, 30, 40, 50 patients walking into an ER in an hour or, or two with COVID, people, uh, hospitals being overwhelmed, we have sort of stopped talking about testing. But I think without that testing data, we're not going to know uh, when it's safe to come out. Um, that to me uh, is key. The one thing that is, you know, I, I think we, we want to get through this, um, but we can't go through this again. Uh, our next question comes from Stacy. She asks, I lost her question. Is plant-based diet without adding organic meat preferable or is limited meat okay? Yeah. So no doubt a diet that focuses, that's plant-based, um, is if you want to optimize. Uh, I certainly, uh, I, uh, I eat meat, um, uh, but uh, if you want to really lower your LDL, the fact is, um, you know, plant-based diets uh, get you uh, there. Um, so I, you know, I think it's it's a matter of choice. Uh, it's a matter of what your goals are. Just get the limit your uh, fast carbs. Look at your LDL um, and try to get those down. If you can get that down with you know some a combination of plants and uh, some meat, um, that's great. Okay, and this is going to be our last question. Um, Schiff asks, what are your thoughts about intermittent fasting? So I have studied this um, and I've looked at the data and I've been part of symposiums that have focused on this. No doubt um, that intermittent fasting um, is um, a way to quiet um, it, I mean, it, it can have uh, positive effects uh, on metabolic health and the parameters um, that we've talked about. The, the, the issue is whatever uh, diet you choose, you need to be uh, you need to be with it for the long term. Um, and um, so, uh, while there there does seem to be some uh, effect in the very short term. I haven't seen long-term data uh, to suggest that it's the panacea uh, for metabolic health. Um, but again, we're still learning more. Those trials are underway. Tom, thanks for uh, pulling this off. Uh, I will tell you, um, I was a bit uh, nervous uh, that we would be able to, to succeed, but you got us there. And uh, thank you um, uh, to Brad or Alyssa and the entire politics and pros uh, staff uh, for pulling this off. Everybody stay safe and be well. And many thanks, many, many thanks uh, for letting me uh, be with you this afternoon. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Kessler. And just to remind everyone to please buy his book. There's a green button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you want to follow us for more of these events, there's a follow button at the top. And we'll see you again next time. Take care.